a couple weeks ago, I gave my rector's address to the entire community out here. And um, I began by saying I want all of you to have the hearts of shepherds. So that's, of course, close to the uh, central teaching of Pope Francis. It's also in line with um, the new evangelization focus of the previous two popes. So I uh, reflected on that, and I'll just give you maybe a shorter version of the talk I gave the students. I began with the um, great parable of the Lord about the um, good shepherd and the lost sheep, but I said the valences have to be reversed. So in the parable, you've got the one that's wandered away and the 99 who remain. Now it's like the opposite. It's like the 99 who've wandered away and the one that remains. Or to put it in our, our categories, maybe 75 have wandered away and 25 remain. But the point is, if you've got, for one sheep that's lost, you have a shepherd's heart. How much more for 75 who've wandered away? So that should be, I said, the attitude of a priest today, not just maintaining parishes, but actively seeking the lost. So I made six recommendations, six suggestions. Here's the first one, if you want to have a shepherd's heart. Pray. Now, I know it sounds maybe a little facile or a little pious, but um, in the Bible, nothing great is ever accomplished, ever, apart from prayer. Billy Graham, when he would um, go on a crusade, would send a group one year in advance into the city to pray. Not to work on logistics or practicalities, but to pray, period. So I said, you want Catholics to come back home? Pray, pray. Uh, I also made reference to um, some of these focus missionaries I've come to know. I love the focus kids. They work on these university campuses and they give themselves for a year of serious evangelizing. I met some in Arizona and I said, well, what's your, what's your first move when you got here? And they said, well, we decided to identify the most influential student and then pray for his conversion. And the most influential student, they said, was the quarterback of the football team. I said, oh, well, how's that working out? They said, well, we prayed for like three or four months every day by name for him. And we haven't gotten him yet, but we have his roommate and his girlfriend. <laughs> they both converted. So I said, well, you got him surrounded. It's just a matter of time. They pray. They pray. So parish priests, I think, to pray by name in a focused way for uh, Catholics who've wandered away. Maybe even, following the focus principle, um, identify someone in the parish whose conversion would be very powerful and influential. Think of in, in Augustine's Confessions, uh, Marius Victorinus was a famous uh, philosopher, and he converted to Christianity. It had a huge impact on the young Augustine. Well, if Marius Victorinus becomes a Christian, maybe I could. So I think pray, pray, organize your parish. Do your holy hour. Pray before the Blessed Sacrament in a, in a very clear way for uh, the fallen away. Second recommendation, I told the students, attract, don't wag your finger. Now, I know in these videos I've hit this point before, so I'm not going to belabor it, but in our postmodern time, people don't respond very well to being told what to do. Uh, that tends to um, uh, raise the hackles. Much better, and Pope Francis emphasized this a lot, much better begin with the attractive quality of Christianity. Show the beauty and the form of the Christian life and let people be drawn to it. In the Evangelii Gaudium, his um, exhortation, Pope Francis says, try the via pulchritudinis. That means the way of beauty. And I've said before, maybe bracket for a while the true and the good. Begin with the beautiful. Show how attractive the Christian life is. That's an important um, task. The third recommendation I made was to preach the encounter. So I'm talking to people who will spend the rest of their lives preaching. And I suggested what makes a homily uh, boring is a disassociation of question and answer. Here's what I mean. When I was coming of age, a lot of homilies were very question-centric. The preacher had more questions than we had. Maybe prior to the council, they were very answer-centric. You know, here's all the answers. Well, what makes a homily compelling is when you can bring a human question together with the divine answer. That makes the homily uh, uh, crackle with life. And I think if you look in the Gospels, what you see over and over again is precisely that, is Jesus encountering somebody who's bringing a question, an anxiety, a deep human concern, um, a pain, and then that meets an answer coming from the Lord. I told the students, if you can identify that moment in the reading, the moment of encounter, 
Let that be the center of your homily. And then circle around it. I mean, you can have all sorts of things added to that. But if the center is clear, it's the encounter between the longing of the human heart and the answer of Jesus, then your homily will be compelling to people. So preaching, I think, is really key to this whole uh, process. Fourthly, I said, live the gospel radically. Now, I know this is unfair in a certain way, but this generation of seminarians and young priests are bearing the burden of the sins of many that have gone before them. The priests and bishops in the sex abuse scandal who um, did terrible things. Is it fair that that um, negativity is passed on? No, it's not fair. But nevertheless, it's the case. Which means I think this generation of young priests and seminarians have to bend over backwards to be radical in their commitment to the gospel. What has the church always done in times of crisis? It's gone back to radical gospel evangelical simplicity. That means poverty. That means radical trust in the Lord, acceptance of divine uh, providence. It means obedience to one's superiors. It means a renewed commitment to celibacy. I think all of that is required of this generation if they are to undo the damage of those who have gone before. Again, I'm not blanket in a blanket way blaming the previous generation. There's a handful of people, but yet they've had this very negative impact. So I, I say to the students today, you have the obligation to live in a radical simplicity, poverty, celibacy, a commitment to the Lord, acceptance of your vocation, acceptance and acquiescence to God's providence. This is central to Pope Francis's message, isn't it? What he's trying to do is show that it's the radical gospel that still attracts people. Here's a fifth recommendation. Practice the new apologetics. I've said before, I think, on some of these videos that when I was a coming of age, apologetics had a bad name. It was seen as defensive, it was rationalistic, it was anti-ecumenical, etc. But, you know, in the wake of September 11th, the rise of the new atheism, uh, the now rampant uh, secularism and indifferentism, we massively have a need for a new apologetics. And there's just two things I want to say about it, because it's that's a topic for a whole semester course. One is that understanding of God, not as the bully in the sky, but rather as the condition for the possibility of full human flourishing. Just a word about that. Atheists, both old and new, will feed on this misconception of God as the supreme being who, in a bullying way, is trying to force his way into human affairs, to boss us around, as though he has some need of our moral excellence. See, all of that is a fantasy. All of that is a distortion of the biblical message. As I've said before, the God of the Bible is the God of the burning bush, which means the closer he comes, the more radiant and beautiful we become, and we are not consumed. God is not a bullying competitor to the human project, but he's the condition for the possibility of that project succeeding. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. I think we've been lousy as a church at propagating that correct view of God. The more we propagate the bully in the sky, the more we're vulnerable to the atheist criticism. And so I, tell, I told these guys, take your courses in God very seriously. It's not just mental gymnastics. That's essential for the right proclamation of the gospel. The second thing is to understand Jesus as the climax of history. I won't do it now because I'm too complicated, but that night I gave a talk, I took a dollar bill out of my pocket, out of the wallet, and I showed them the back of the dollar bill. And you can see this, of course, the, the little engraving of a pyramid with an eye on top. And the pyramid's got 13 levels, so for the 13 uh, colonies, the eye on top is the eye of divine providence, construed in a more enlightenment way. But then underneath the pyramid, in that little scroll, it says, Novus Ordo Seculorum, the new order of the ages. Well, that's modernity's understanding, that history climaxes in the 18th century with the rise of the physical sciences and the emergence of the liberal democracies. This is the new order of the ages. And then it says also on that little seal, Anuit Cheptus, it's the eye of God, nods Anuit Cheptus to these new undertakings. So it's, it's the Enlightenment understanding of how history comes to its climax. We say no as Christians. 
History did not climax in the 18th century, as important as those advances were. It climaxed on a squalid hill outside Jerusalem in the first century, when the one who spoke and acted in the very person of God took upon himself all the dysfunction of the world and swallowed it up in the divine mercy. It was the cross of Jesus that represents the Novus Ordo Seclorum. The church has for too long allowed itself to be positioned by the modern construal of how history comes to a climax. History can't have two climaxes. It's got one. And we announce it as the dying and rising of Jesus. And that needs to be central to any successful new evangelization. So those two features of a new apologetics are key. Here's the last one, last recommendation. I said, go door to door. Now, I've made a career the last several years out of evangelizing through the media. I believe in it. I believe it's, it's essentially important. I want the students to learn it. However, the real thing happens finally only through a personal encounter. Think of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, or think of um, Paul uh, addressing people in Corinth or Athens. Evangelization happens person to person. It happens face, face to face. The sharing of one's faith. I want these young guys to have the courage and the moxie to go door to door. Find people that have been on your parish rolls and have fallen out of practice. Don't go to Mass anymore. Don't still have records? Go. Find them. Maybe bring them a, a tape or, or a CD or bring them a book or something. Uh, simply announce, here we are and, and we'd like to have you back in church and if you want to talk and any questions I can answer, I'd be happy to do it. Go door to door. Don't be afraid of that. Don't hide in your rectory. Don't hide simply in your established parish programs, but go out. And I'd say two by two. We shouldn't go out just by ourselves. Go out two by two. Go door to door to find the fallen away. Have a shepherd's heart. The shepherd is never happy if one sheep is wandering away. A fortiori, the shepherd today should have a broken heart over the 75 who wandered away. Use these six things to cultivate a shepherd's strategy to accompany the pathos of your shepherd's heart. Mm -hmm.